happy to have uh, Shubhavik Mandal from the uh, University of British Columbia and also IAS, who's going to tell us about DNA theory via prismatic efforts. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak. Uh, so this is in some sense work in progress, and there's one paper in my website with this title. I just also wanted to write that one down because it's different from the title of the talk. Um, so the goal of my talk today is to explain um, how to obtain classification of finite locally free commutative loop schemes of P power rank. And so P will also be a fixed prime throughout this talk. And such objects will be denoted as FFG. And often we'll just mean the category of such objects when we write FFG. Um, using prismatic F gauges, and classifying stacks. Uh, so before we go there, let me just uh, quickly pick some notations. So K is a perfect field of electricity P and so W of K is the stuff we would like this P typical for us. And this as an endomorphism, she called it for pages. Um, so I guess the first motivating theorem for us uh, is the we do to call this theorem one. Yeah. Category DK of P divisible groups of WK, sorry, over K is equivalent to <clears throat> finite free WK modules M with a semilinear map. So it is a semilinear such that so it satisfies this condition that PM must be contained in the image of so I guess the main theme is that on one side, we have some objects appear in algebraic geometry or number theory, but on the other side, we just have linear algebra. And let me also write down the case for FFGs. So so this would mean uh, finite locally free, all those adjectives, group schemes, but over K. So this is equivalent. And here I want to use contravariant DNA theory. So let me just try anti equivalent. <laughs> anti equivalent to the following category. And let me just denote this functor as G going to M of G. So MG will be the kind of modules so that's um, finite length. WK modules, which has sort of two operators on them. So this one satisfies and they're required to satisfy identity that the compositions are all equal to P. Uh, so just 
one little thing I want to point out is that uh, so for finite local field group schemes, we have this extra operator V, which is something that doesn't really show up in the classification of P divisible groups, but that's because uh, so that operator is kind of hidden in the conditions that appear here. So here M is free. So actually one can define V to be F inverse of P. Uh, but when we want to work with finitely, finite locally free group schemes, these modules are actually all killed by some power of P. So hiding some data like that wouldn't really work. And we really need to add the data V to obtain a classification here. And just another small observation for what might be important later on that you can also realize this is some kind of inverse of the divided Frobenius if you want. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me also start by giving a reminder on how this functor is classically defined. Sometimes they can be a bit complicated to write down. So, so the definition of mg, so say if g is unipotent, and in this case, being unipotent is the same thing as saying that the Cartier dual is infinitesimal, or maybe killed by some power of the Frobenius. So in that case, we define mg as this direct limit, and this Wn are n truncated weak limits. So basically, we could take n truncated width vectors for any k algebra a, and that defines the group scheme. Uh, we're just using the group schemes. And uh, if G is multiplicative, so then MG is defined as, so in this case, under assumptions, the Cartier dual of G uh, will be unipotent. And we could apply the previous definition and then kind of dualize back. And this can be viewed as certain duodoni modules. So I should have said that, uh, that objects of this kind will be called duodoni modules. So it's a WK module with two other operators with some compatibilities. <clears throat> <clears throat> So I think the first result I want to talk about is uh, sort of how to give a different description of the functor mg that appears here. So so let g be in f of g of k, then. Mg is isomorphic to second crystalline cohomology of this classifying stack of G. So here Bg denotes the classifying stack of G. Uh, so I want to explain the sketch proof. Uh, so the proof that I'm going to explain is uh, kind of different than one proof that I had I had earlier. So, um, okay. So we will construct. Okay. So first, we assume that G is unipotent. Then, what we'd like to do is we would like to construct a map from M G to H to press B G. So I'm ignoring. Uh, the Frobenius twist for now. Um, so if G is unipotent, uh, this MG, every element is killed by some power of V, 
And we're trying to map that into crystalline cohomology of BG. And there's actually a technique for kind of finding V torsion in crystalline cohomology by using the Durham Witt complex, which I think is an uh, earlier construction of Elusi. So this is a construction of Lucy. Uh, so let me just try to explain that a little bit. So say that A is the polynomial algebra over K. So then we have the Durham width complex of A, which looks like this. Um, then one can define some other complex where we only sort of change the first differential and we make it f to the n d. And so there's a natural map here where we use v to the n. So we have a map of complexes because of the identity f d v equals d. So So what this uh, sort of does is that we get a fiber sequence to form so here I'm just using that uh, w mod v to the n is just w of n and further uh, this also gives me a map in derived category like this. So in this step, I'm using that uh, hyperhomology of the Durham width complex, mm -hmm. same as crystalline homology because A is a polynomial algebra. So, so you can also take some direct limit over N and this gives me a map of this form. And we're going to assume A to be a polynomial algebra, but you can use, let's say, animation or some left kind extension. So then you end up with a map and the right and uh, so I think the left hand side would not change even if you animate because these things are built out of finitely many things. So and this is what is all the derived crystalline You're saying the less this left hand side is left hand extended from polynomials. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is that we're just going to apply this construction to the stack BG. So if we do that, extend it to BG. So if we do that, we end up with a natural map this form. And this side uh, so. identifies with mg, and this gives me the natural map. And so once we have the natural map to check that it's an isomorphism, so 
to check isomorphism. And then we could uh, do some reductions and prove some properties about all the sites. So we can assume K is algebraically closed and then maybe do some kind of inductive arguments to reduce to when G is alpha P or Z mod P. And in those cases, basically, we need to now compute these objects. So these are also just the first Deram homology groups. And you can compute them by, by, for example, using the conjugate filtration. And this, all these groups are actually small to k, which is also uh, what m of alpha p or z mod p would be. And so these computations, they appear in the work of Payne, Barber, and k. The construction of the map didn't use the unipotence hypothesis, but the fact uh, no, but otherwise I think it's a zero map. Yeah. So if he is multiplicative, so we can use party duality. So there's still a little bit of watch here, which I'm not going to talk about, but um, also I think to do the step here, we sometimes need to compute things like crystalline cohomology of mu p to the n or something, just maybe h2 crystalline of b mu p to the n, and those things can be computed. So I guess it's kind of like the ability to sort of do the small computations that really go into the other step here as well. Okay, so I think this ends the proof, a sketch of the proof. So can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, is it possible to do such a proof using uh, the, like the description using crystalline diodonet theory like uh, Bertelot Brin? Yeah, so this is the earlier proof that I had, which used uh, the description using crystalline diodonet theory. Uh, but now what I'm going to talk about is to kind of reprove the result that I think you were talking about in crystalline diodonic theory. So let's explain the corollary of this. And this is uh, the result due to the birth law, brain, and nursing. And the result is that This is happening in the big display side. Um, so actually the proof that appears uh, in this book, uh, so I, I think it firstly also uses some uniform description due to Fontaine where he used another kind of formal group called CW, which is a little bit complicated. And also I think it relied on kind of how to understand CW in the big crystalline site. So it also relied on having to do a lot of uh, pretty detailed kind of constructions in the big crystalline site. And so I want to explain now that we can just obtain this from what we have shown. So on one side, we have sigma star mg, and then we showed that this is H2 plus Bg. And this sort of used the Deram uh, kind of explanation there. And so in this case, this you use that this is also the same as the third homology of the 
stack B2G. So this B2G is, I guess, the twofold classifying stack. And then one can show that this is the same as Shikoma Opus. So for the step here, we can try to compute the cohomology of B2G in the crystalline site. And then there's some looping, delooping argument, which would show that this has to be the same as the X groups. And uh, this looping, delooping actually works better if you use B2G, which is I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, instead of directly trying to use H2 Chris BG, I'm actually using H3 B2G. Uh, okay, so this gets the proof. Sorry, sorry for my ears. Why, how do you regard G as in the object of the crystalline state? Uh, I, I, uh, there is, I think, a way to take any scheme and realize this as, a, as, a, as an object of a crystal insight, kind of ignore the thickening and evaluate on the scheme. So B2G is a two-stack? Sorry? B2G is a, is a two-stack, is a higher stack? Or... Right, exactly, yeah. So B2G is a two-stack. And uh, so what I would like to do now is uh, sort of try to explain uh, how to reconstruct G from the Dudoni module. And so, as we saw, this is uh, some crystalline cohomology group. So I also kind of roughly think of this as uh, some cohomological data. And when G is just over a perfect field, of course, there's some classical way of doing this, but I want to explain a slightly different way, which... Wait, sorry, I have a question. So the two, uh, in the second and third equality, really, like, do you use the precise assumptions of the setup uh, in both steps, or...? Yeah, I think this one is H1 BG is zero, uh, which is, I think it needs that we are working over a field, which is perfect of characteristic B. Yeah, I think we need to use some more assumption. It's not something that always holds. But also for the going from H3 to X1, you need. Uh, yeah, I think here I use that the cohomology of point is zero. But I think we need, sorry, I mean the higher cohomology of the point is zero. But there's always some, some small vanishings that one needs. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. None of these are, I think, like completely formal. So you need some small vanishings. But also using P torsion freeness of W, right? <laughs> um, so, so I sort of want to explain this uh, by some analogy with the situation that happens for locally compact abelian groups. So on this side, we have locally compact abelian groups. And on this side, I want to work with finite flat group schemes. So in this side, uh, we have for point of duality, um, which gives an anti equivalence. And on this side, we have Cartier duality. Sends G to This is also an active balance. And when G is finite, there's also a purely topological way to understand the Cartier, uh, understand the point of green dual. So in this case, it's the same as, so assume finite abelian. Okay. Yeah, so singular cohomology. And in this case, this was, I can show that this is also the same as
itself doing this in some process implementation. So also this step here, for example, uses the ZP1 being a tet module this bit option free. Um, and since these two stacks are gonna show up like later, I'm, I'm so just writing it down. So actually both of these groups in particular are isomorphic to X1 from G to ZP1, which because G is killed by power of P, that's the same as home from G into GN. Yeah. Uh, so this ZP1 is the get module of GM. Yeah. So now, uh, by work of partner Solze, and Pat Luri, so there's a way to understand the state module of GM. So let me just write this as ZP1 of S. Um, so by this, I, what I really mean is this object. So this is the same as weight one syntonic homology. And this is a theorem because syntonic homology is defined as So now I'm uh, only working in the characteristic P case. So and so this is what's called uh, an eigen filtration. On crystalline homology, and uh, this is the canonical map of the filtration, and this is the divided Frobenius, and this ZP one is the fiber of the difference between the two maps. Uh, so we can also apply this to BG. So what that would mean is that. Uh, so, in particular, uh, I guess the point that I'd like to make is that if you want to sort of recover the Cartier dual of G, you kind of need to understand one cohomology group with coefficient the tet module of GM. And all those things are kind of captured here. So, if I could record all of this data, I should just be able to kind of reconstruct the group scheme. So, what I want to do is kind of remember all the data. So I also have the divided Frobenius that shows up here, which will be quite important for doing this. <laughs> so 
So this brings me to guess half of the title of the talk. So uh, such data can naturally be stored in terms of FKS. So uh, the part that I'm talking about now is kind of like a version of this theory over perfect fields of characteristic P, oh, so this is K. And if I think in this case, this is due to contain yes. So let me just quickly talk about what an F cage is. So what's an F cage? Um, so I think I'll just focus on the case when K is FP. So in that case, there will be no Frobenius twist, and it's just a bit easier to talk about. So, so FK will be the following data. So I will have MI, some ZP modules for all I in Z. Sorry, can I ask you what did you write on the top of the report? So still you can. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, such data can be naturally stored in an so in in f gauges and in the case of a perfect fields uh this is due to fontaine and Janssen. and okay so i have this modules mi zp modules and um i'm sure So we have the snaps between them, which satisfies this identity is that FV equals BF equals P. I have to go back here. And so I think the data we have written down, it can also be uh, explained as quasi-quant sheets in some stack. And maybe I'll just try to write it down, keeping uh, in mind that later on we'll be also talking a little bit about the stacky approach to F cages and so on due to Grimple and Bartlery. So just write down the small places using stacks as well. So the stack I'll write down will be called spec fp so it's like n n for nidot and uh this stack is so f will have degree one b will have degree minus one as a graded ring and so with this grading this is a gm action so just quotient by it. so whatever we have is basically having a graded module over this graded ring, which in the language of stats is what it means. And so there are also some maps between this uh, stats. So one is, let's say, And there's also a similar map Sorry for the sloppiness here. What I wanted to say is that there's one map that goes like this, and then 
kind of the map that I just want to use. And so in this case, we can also define M infinity as whole limit over F and M negative infinity as whole limit over P. And so this M infinity is obtained by kind of pulling back along this map. And this M, uh, M minus infinity is obtained by pulling back along this map. So it's like you're inverting F and that's kind of like saying you're, you're taking the column to yeah. And so in the data of an F case, there's also an additional isomorphism between M negative infinity and M infinity. And this is where you use the stack that's called symptomification. And this is defined as equalizer. So I have two maps here and I have two pullbacks and I want to impose an isomorphism between the two things that's saying that I will glue these two pieces inside this along these maps. So if you also want to divide out T where you have to be. Oh yeah, sorry, you're, you're absolutely right. Thank, Thank you. you. You also have to divide out by G. Thank you. So Right. So, so the data of an F cage is the same data as a quasi cold sheep on this stack that we, we wrote down. And uh, so let's also kind of discuss one example of an F cage. So, so let D be a finite. Free. So actually, before I do that, I just wanted to explain one more thing. So I think I just wanted to explain in this setup how to think of the divided Frobenius. So what happens often is that, so for F cages, uh, one can often assume some effectivity conditions that are met. So we can assume that M negative infinity is the same as M zero. So the maps, on, on the left of zero induced by V, we can assume all of them to be isomorphism. So let's say often this condition is met. And so there's a map from MK to M infinity, kind of by the definition there. And then from M infinity, there's an isomorphism with M negative infinity, again, the data of the F cage. And then from M negative infinity, I have this isomorphism with M0. And so the whole composition here, um, so let's say if I write pi k to be the whole composition, so this is some, some way to capture the divided from areas. So this is the, it's some kind of divided from areas. So I'm just kind of explaining this as a sanity check because I want to keep track of the divided from areas, and then I was saying that let's package everything in an F cage. So there should be some way of thinking about the divided from areas in the world of F cages as well. So I was just trying to explain why how it works. Okay. So um, so let D be a finite free Z module and Assume that the bijection so it's a linear map, so it's nice more. Right. 
Uh, so in this case, what we can define is say di to be x in d such that fx is in p to the i of d. And so this gives some kind of uh, decreasing filtration. And there are also maps the other ways. So to get that one, what we want to do is just multiply by P to go from DI to DI plus one. And I will not check this, but there's a way to use this data to construct an FH. So I guess um, to maybe a result or some construction due to obtain the Janssen in their favor is that, um, so it's actually possible to take D to be crystalline homology of some variety X and then refine it into the structure of an F gauge. And refine it as an F gauge. So you mean crystalline homology of some degree, I, I suppose? Sorry? It's like a module and... Uh... Right, so I think I, I was being vague about this, but uh, you can... Also take whole crystalline cohomology and see this as an object in the derived category of the stack. So otherwise, for yeah. Uh, so I tried to introduce all of this basically uh, in an attempt to rephrase the second theorem that I stated in the beginning. So, so this is on the beginning uh, restated. So there's still some things to check here, but I'm just writing the statement. So there is a fully faithful counter from finite flat competitive groups. And so people are ranked to category of F cages of K. And one can also do this construction using the classifying stack, keeping in mind what we we're explaining earlier. So what we could do is send G to H2 Chris BG but refine as an F cage. Uh, so maybe it's worth pointing out that in general, uh, the category of F cages is much larger than the category of finite flat group schemes. And there are also ways to identify the essential image, which I'll not talk about now. And, <clears throat> but in general, this category is much bigger, for example, and in some ways also, I think, nicer as a category. Sorry, what does H2 mean now? Uh, like I have sort of derived F gauge, and then you look at the second cohomology shape, or do you do something different to it? Um, so, I guess one could use the Nigan filtration to explicitly define the F gauge as well. And in, in this case, I could also take H2 crystalline BG and then H2 crystalline of the first Nigan filtration and then get the F gauge as well. But is it like a torsion free F gauge? Or 
uh, no, this will not be a torsion free FKH when G is finite flat. Because H2 Chris, BG is torsion. Oh, sorry, torsion in the other direction, uh, in F and B. Or, like, if so, it's mod P, I can ask, what, you know, if it's somehow, like, it's a sheaf on a cross, and I can ask if it's torsion free. Um, <coughs> so, it's not falling very well, maybe. Sorry, I'm uh, just curious what kind of coherent shapes these are. Oh, I, I think this will still be uh, some complexes with torn amplitude in 0 and 1. Ah, okay. okay. So this is a derived infinity curve of what's coherent one. So this can be realized just as a discrete module as well, but in general, they should really land in some derived category, which I'll state in that formulation okay. pretty soon. Uh, but if you want to understand the torn amplitude, then it's in zero and one. So here also is explicitly some complex of vector bundles, which has two terms. So is it H2 of something, or is it just notational? Um, I wouldn't say it's H2 literally like this. I think it's notational, so, right. okay. But so I think one thing one can do is just to take the Dividone module to be literally H2. And then we also have H2 crystalline of the first nugget filtration of BG. And then we could try to just take those two things and organize in the FKG as well. So in that sense, I guess the notational kind of is close to what's happening to them. Okay, um, so I think after this, uh, maybe I want to talk about slightly more general base rings, but uh, these base rings, I will always assume them to be quasi symptomic. So, I guess kind of directly, I want to talk about base rings in mixed characteristic. And so, as before, I'd like to use a uh, homological methods. But like data to classify root schemes. Uh, so in this context, uh, what I want to explain will be use prismatic homology. And so it's introduced in the work of uh, Rob Solze and in the work of button software. And so recently, there's a, a tacky reformulation or stacky approach to this due to trade field and what Lurie. So I think when I use prismatic homology, I'll always be using absolute prismatic homology. But so what this work allows us to do is uh, with any, uh, say, periodic formal scheme, one can attach a periodic formal stack, which is called the prismatization of X. And so this has the property that the theory of prismatic homology um, can just be understood in terms of homology of the structure sheaf on the stack X prism. And then there are also some other related refinements. And uh, what I want to use is the one that's called symptomification. So it's just So the symptomification is naturally equipped with um, some line bundle. It's called the broad descent twist. And so it's possible, so say here I need to assume maybe that X is 
for asymptotic. So it's possible to understand the uh, understand symptomic cohomology of X in terms of cohomology all of 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 this line bundles. So. And so for the kind of things I was interested in earlier, I only need this in weight one, but uh, So from now, let me assume that uh, I'm working over a base, base string S that's uh, processing for me. And so, so that I want to state, this is essentially uh, into shoots. And the cross, uh, but they used a different formulation for this. So, so the statement is that if we look at the category of p divisible groups over S, then this embeds fully faithfully into the category of S sin, and so I should have made made this definition here that. So for the defined the prismatic F gauge is complexes on the stack X. So There is a, this is a fully faithful. And I want to explain the construction of this functor using classifying stacks as well. Uh, so what that would do is that, so say if I take some p divisible group G, then I could take PG sin. Uh, there's a natural map to S sin. And so here I want to take the second so push forward of BG sin. And this will be an object in, say, DQC of. Thin, but one can prove that this is actually a vector bundle. No, but in this context of finite plan groups concerns, well, you could do the same formula, but uh, only for only for a characteristic field, perfect field, then you could still do R2 F loss, the kind of thing. Uh, I was just trying to explain uh -huh. how to actually define this in terms of H2 without the quotes. I could do something similar when S is a function field of characteristic field. Or if S is in characteristic field, but in mixed, uh, I think in mixed characteristic there are some more problems. But in characteristic P, we could just just do like a very similar formula. So in characteristic P, uh, if we walk quasi symptomic locally, uh, I think I'm using the fact that A is speed torsion free. So there's some some better control on the torsion that uh, that one may not have in general. <laughs> Sorry, can you un uncover the what you just put on the screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
I just wanted to make some small comments about this is that on shoots and Libra, they, they use what, what they call admissible um, prismatic Tidore module. So uh, in general, uh, this is not equipped with a divider Frobenius. So this is not something that causes a problem because we are landing in, in certain vector bundles here. But in general, uh, not including the divided Frobenius, it doesn't work well if you want to classify uh, finite locally pre group schemes. Uh, we really need the divided Frobenius, and then we will actually uh, need the formalism of prismatic FKs in a more crucial way. So, <laughs> um, <coughs> Says that okay, so I think as before, S is quasi symptomic. So, so then there is a fully faithful counter here to. QC of SN. Let me explain the construction. Yes. So this is something that we only have to do in mixed characteristic and characteristic P the construction be uh, a bit simpler. So G would go to, so here I could take B two G sin. And then this is naturally lives over S sin. So now actually B two G sin is a three stack because G sin was already a one stack. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to take dot dot four to G sin, and then I want to hit it. So this is homological index. And then I have a shift by three. And it's possible to simplify this formula as well. And so we take the connective cover. Uh, so actually, I think in this formulation, the formula looks very similar to the one due to Butler, Brin, and Messing, which they used in the context of crystalline DNA theory. And uh, we, we need to use this B2G sin because there are some problems due to uh, like, like some torsion that can stay. Like, I think it can happen that we may have some quasi-regular semi-perfectoid algebra, and there are P-torsion in the prismatic cohomology of that. But this is not something that happens in characteristic P. So if you're all interested in characteristic P, we could just take BG and then we have a similar kind of formula uh, in that context. So uh, which, which Grotendieck topology do you use for uh, here? Uh, uh, I think on S sin, uh, this doesn't matter so much because the objects are all quasi coherent, like in the derived category. But I could use maybe even some P completely faithfully flat or quasi symptomic to scan. So G sin means the push forward of the structure sheet. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, okay. I think another thing I wanted to mention is that uh, so in the case of BTN, uh, case of in the case of BTN S, uh, a related or I think a similar result uh, has been recently obtained in the work of Keith and Akin. Uh, 
Uh, um, but I think our methods kind of go in different directions. So I think they analyze certain counters from this side to this side, and they prove several properties about that. And in this proof, I also use the same functor, but mostly kind of as an adjoint to my existing functor. So uh, the proofs are a little bit different. And they have, of course, the lens in the opinion category. Or oh, in, in just in the category of FK, it's not in the derived category, right? I think for BDNs, that's because I think generally it just happens to be some vector bundles in the O mod P to the N if you're in the crystalline setup. So I think for BDN, it's likely that you don't need that. But yes, for I think here we would need actual complexes. Uh, okay, yeah, so maybe I'll stop now. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? So this shift of three is just to make this comparison. Yeah, I think the things I was explaining earlier, there was one H2B2G of ZP1, that gave me the Cartier dwell. That's why I have the shift of three to split things back in the right place. Maybe this is the same as what, but you must, but do you explain what fully faithful means exactly? So on the left, you have an, a one category. That is implicit here that there's some no higher X between the corresponding occasions? In the essential image, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, not X, maybe the negative X, but, because, so I don't mean fully faithful. Uh, so I would have higher X if this was a stable in pretty category, but it's not. So it's basically just negative X. And then I don't think it's a maybe very strong statement. Okay. Okay. Those of course on the negative homotopy groups. So it's a question about the big spaces. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I guess there's also maybe it doesn't really make sense to be able to enhance it anymore because there's no more extra structure on the side on the left. Um but maybe one could say that it's possible to read off uh quasi symptomic cohomology of some group scheme from, from this side as well. So did, did you say that the X to one, for example, is the same on the left and the right side or not? Oh, no, I didn't say that. Is it possible to recover uh, the direct direct image are you low start from its truncation? Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, I think it's a very good question. So basically that amounts to computing the whole cohomology. And I think in some cases, I think uh, uh, Shi Zhang, Dimitri, and I are trying to obtain some of those computations. Uh, but if, if G happens to be a P divisible group, so in this setup, if G is P divisible, and I want to take this uh, RU law star, so maybe it, it might be slightly easier for me to say in terms of uh, J law star U. And so this we expect to be a symmetric algebra to, for p divisible groups. And this can be checked from UP infinity, I think, already, but we, we, we expect this for any p divisible group. So here are statements beyond the quality symptomic case. Sorry, do I have statements outside that case? Yeah, so I think this is something I'm trying to think about, and uh, which is maybe related to some of the questions I asked you. So in 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 uh, I think in order to remove the quasi symptomic case, uh, one would want to work with some derived stack because I think in order to have this kind of isomorphism, uh, one shouldn't expect to be able to do this with ordinary higher stacks. So I think I'm using higher stacks, but they are ordinary higher stacks. But for outside the quasi symptomic case, I think. Um, it, it seems plausible because I think one of the main things we really need is, is this isomorphism. And maybe this can be made to work by working with derived stacks as well under maybe certain small assumptions. Uh, but there are, I think, still some difficulties. So maybe, yeah. So by a derived stack, you mean a sheaf of anima on derived rings as opposed to one? Sheaf of anima on animated rings. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? 
not, let's uh, thank Shwadi for this. Thank you.